Sometime later, I awoke and had to use the head. Naomi had dimmed the lights when I had fallen asleep and had not brightened them, which was her usual way to let me know it was morning. So I went back to bed, this time in my berth. I did not fall back asleep right away, though. Instead, I lay there thinking about what had happened in the salon earlier. I was confused about the emotions I was feeling, but I had to admit I felt better. Eventually, I fell back to sleep. I slept a long time before the soft chimes woke me. Good morning, John. Be aware that the radar unit on Cerro Crocker is detecting an approaching storm front. It is now 1340. I expect rain will begin falling over the target area in approximately three hours, and this will likely continue for much of the night. The skies are currently overcast and the surface winds are calm. The higher altitude winds are out of the southeast and steady. These weather conditions are close to optimal for our purposes. In five hours at near 19 o'clock, we will begin our assault on the enemy base. I sat up and stretched. What do you need me to do until then? Nothing pressing until 16 o'clock. Then you may assist Omu in getting equipment moved onto the deck, she replied. The bio drone delivery pods and lofting balloons need to be prepared in advance, and this will take approximately two hours. We will then need to prep Habu with the first external pod load of assault mobile units. She will be flying them to where the aquatic drone is waiting. Until your help is required, I suggest a thorough review of the layout of the enemy facility would be prudent, Naomi said. I started off with a long hot shower. I did not worry about wasting hot water as Nautilus had plenty of power thanks to both our current idle status and the fact the boat's DET was connected to its own dedicated fusion power reactor buried somewhere back in Tennessee. As I stood there, I thought about many things. Worry about the pending attack later tonight being the main topic. Another was what the AI had done and said last night. I finished up my shower and air dry and returned to my berth to get dressed. Naomi, about last night, I am confused about what I am feeling about that. That is understandable, John. You are under a great deal of stress. I would suggest that you put it out of your mind for now and focus on the needs of the day. There will be time to sort out your feelings after we are successful, she said. That sounded like a good idea. I'd most likely be dead soon, and my turmoil would be for naught. Naomi continued, Once things settle down, then we will discuss your intentions towards my daughter. I had been leaving my berth, and her words caused me to run into the edge of the hatch. Rubbing my hip, I thought about her shock comment. I was reminded that Omu's prankster AI personality was shared with Naomi. They were basically one communal thinking entity, and of course, they would be working to develop and use humor as a way of keeping me balanced, or unbalanced in this case. Good one, Naomi, what's for breakfast? After I ate, I spent the early afternoon, my new morning, going over the images and layouts of the enemy launch facility. Ohomu was busy making final preparations to launch our flight of ninja bats, but insisted that she had it covered for now. Naomi was clearly busy but had enough spare processing power, so that it seemed that she was devoting her complete attention to walking me through the attack plan and answering my questions. I was sure the AI was keeping many of the small details of the operation from me, but I was still astounded at the complexity of what she did share. To boil it down succinctly, we had to use stealth to get close enough to insert an override module into the main processor for the base. While we did that, we had to prevent two things. The first was to keep the enemy AI there, or any of its more intelligent sub-presences, from warning the master AI in space. The second was to keep the AI from detonating the base's large fusion scuttling charge. If either happened, our attack would fail, and the master AI would become aware of our threat, and likely also Naomi, Nautilus, and my backups, meaning any possibilities for future attacks would be stillborn. To make matters worse, not only did we have to prevent the scuttling charge from being detonated, we also had to prevent the noticeable destruction of any parts of the facility. There were large quantities of volatile chemicals used in the manufacture of the launch vehicles, which we would have to protect. Another threat was the thousands of small fusion bomblets used as propulsion for the launch vehicles, even something as simple as opening a valve and causing a large deuterium spill would be unexplainable enough to trigger an investigation. With those goals in mind, our attack would include three main objectives. The first objective was to temporarily disrupt all ground to satellite communications. 
Naomi already had control of the dish antenna on Cerro Crocker as a result of my recent successful mission there. We would also need to disable or disrupt the main antennas at the launch facility itself. This would include the local wireless network and the uplinks to the satellites. Many of the enemy's mobile units had satellite uplinks, but Naomi simply said that she had those covered. The microwave link in the taps I had installed would allow her to use the local data net to upload commands and viruses. These should cause the majority of the lesser mobile units and some semi-intelligent equipment to begin reboot and diagnostic sessions and take them temporarily offline. The higher functioning intelligences would need a more direct approach. This was where the bats and the assault quadruped mobile units would come into play. A large number of bats would be on patrol and targeted on any stationary or mobile units not disabled by Naomi remotely. The second attack objective was to prevent the enemy AI from destroying itself and the base. We would again use the bats to immediately sever the hard data lines between the main processor and the fusion scuttling charge. Naomi was able to trace and isolate the three redundant conduits which would need to be disrupted. The bats would also have to disable any wireless receivers on the fusion device controller itself simultaneously. Elsewhere around the base, the quadruped mobile units and more bats would be on guard for any attempts to sabotage either the factory or the propulsion bomblets. Naomi was more worried about the buildings and chemical storage tanks as she said the fusion bomblets were unlikely to be detonated without the high intensity triggering lasers and confinement and shock absorbing magnetics used on the orbital booster itself. The last and main attack objective was the enemy's main artificial intelligence presence itself. We needed to force it into the override mode similar to what I did to Agent back in Tennessee centuries ago. To do this, our forces would first need to isolate the AI from the local network by severing both the hardwired and wireless transmitters. Then they would need to quickly enter the secured structure where the main processor was located. Once inside, the bats containing copies of the Hemru algorithms would need to physically breach the processor enclosure and insert the override code directly into the main processor data input port. This would trigger an immediate override session and allow Naomi deep access using the codes included with the algorithms. After all three of these objectives were secured, then my part of the operation would come into play. I was to physically deliver one of the new portable processors to the enemy facility processor hardware area as quickly as possible. The suitcase-sized package contained a limited copy of Naomi's presence. Once it was connected directly to the base AI, Naomi would be able to directly interface with the master AI in space without it noticing any new latency issues. She would then have to use all her processing power to continue to placate the master AI and keep it from growing suspicious. Aside from duping the master AI into thinking that all was normal at this launch facility, she would have higher access to the enemy's space-based network. We needed the data and codes stored in the local enemy processor for this, which was another reason we had to take it over intact. After the three objectives were achieved, we would also have to scramble to repair all the severed data links as fast as possible. Think minutes fast. Further delays would be noticed. After that, the base was ours, at least until the master AI randomly sent down a physical lander from space. This could happen in a week or not for decades. But until then, we could use the base to prepare for the next step in our plan, which was taking the fight to space. I finished reviewing the plan and felt both hope and doubt. Many tricky and dangerous steps needed to happen perfectly, almost instantly, and even worse, almost simultaneously. Welcome to digital warfare between fast thinking machines. With our attack based on organic bats, it was like sending horse cavalry up against modern tanks. Our only hope was surprise. The horses might win if the tanks did not know about them. There were so many things that could go wrong. Lady Luck had better be in a generous mood. Later, after finishing my review, eating a quick meal, and using the head, I changed into a pair of work coveralls and went to help Omu. I found her in the workroom. There were over a dozen pieces of equipment waiting. Three were large cylinders, probably to fit through the deck hatch. After seeing the heavily constructed two-wheel dolly, I reasoned the equipment and cylinders were going to be a bitch. Naomi's going to surface Nautilus soon. We will commence surface activities early as the overcast skies remain and fog has covered much of the area. 
please begin transferring this equipment up to the starboard sponson's deck hatch chamber. Please use caution as some of the equipment is fragile, she instructed. I heard the implied that dangerous, which she had meant by fragile. The first metal cylinder was indeed heavy. It reminded me of an ESU, except it was twice as tall and covered with complicated valves and fittings. What's this? I asked, bracing myself against the bulkhead as Nautilus heaved and rolled a bit. We must have surfaced. That is one of three dewars of liquid hydrogen, John. Each contains approximately 130 liters. Liquid hydrogen? Are we going to be launching missiles or something? No, John. The hydrogen will be gasified and used to inflate the lifting balloons. Oh, for some reason up until now, I had been assuming we would be using helium. Hydrogen provided more lift but was also more dangerous. Hell, I guess in the overall scope of what we were attempting, this one additional bit of danger was minor. Still, I was careful to not ding or drop the door as I wheeled it up to the lift following Omu. She was carrying her own heavy-looking contraption. I found out what it was when she got it up onto the deck and deployed it over the hatch. It was a small telescopic lifting crane. We used the crane to get the dewar and the cart up onto the deck. After the dewar was lashed down stable and safe near the aft end of the flight deck, we returned below. Over the next hour, we got most of the workroom's equipment and hydrogen moved. I was already sweating my ass off and took a moment topside to catch my breath. The seas were oily, smooth swells with just a gentle rolling motion. Visibility was a few hundred meters at best, and the skies were overcast gray when you could see through the spotty surface fog. I heard a metallic groan and turned to see Nautilus's stowable sail being raised. Omu had attached a cable to the top of the sail and then strung it all the way to the rear port side rudder. Her feet somehow had decent traction on the slippery slope tail structure. I remembered from our earlier discussions that the cable was to be an anchoring point for our string of oversized balloons. I went back to work bringing up more equipment. There were 25 folding bat carriers. Each was very lightweight and had enough roof space for 20 bats. I stacked them in a row on the middle of the flight deck. OMU was working to assemble the balloon extruder and inflation equipment. A half dozen of the larger components we had brought up to the deck were joined to make the large complicated device. I then connected it to a power port in the rear of the sail, while Omu connected one of the hydrogen dewars with a heavily insulated hose. The extruder also needed two tanks of polymer. Once it was assembled and fed its feedstock, we were ready to make balloons. The machine looked like a metallic donut about two meters across. Omu started the machine and we watched it go to work. There were various moving crossbars for manipulating the uncured polymers, and a pair of these spun around rapidly spraying hot polymer onto the frictionless center of the donut. I heard a rushing of gas and the center began to bulge upward. I stood there with my mouth open amazed as a two meter diameter cylinder of hydrogen filled clear polymer began to rise from the machine's surface. It had continued growing until it had reached about six meters tall when the arms reversed rotations and gathered in the polymer forming the cylinder's bottom. There was a click and the end was pinched off and the balloon was released. Up it went, and I watched it quickly disappear into the fog and overcast above. Um, Omu, weren't we supposed to attach bats to that? I asked. That was a test balloon. The first meter or so of the polymer film was flawed due to residual trace materials in the feed lines and supply hoses. The next balloon will be usable, she replied. We quickly ramped up production. The extruder would create a balloon envelope and fill it with hydrogen. When it rose to about six meters tall, the machine would seal the end and attach a lightweight tether. I would then clamp on a rugged plastic anchor clip to the end of the tether and then walk the floating balloon over to the anchor cable Omu had strung earlier. Darkness was falling as we depleted the second doer of hydrogen. I switched on the night vision in my goggles and looked up to count the inflated balloons. There were 18 flying above Nautilus. Six more to go. Omu had been busy assembling the bat roost glider pods. When each was unfolded, they looked like a triangular torpedo. The rear end had guide fins and the nose was pointed. On each side was a short pair of stubby wings, which would allow the lightweight pods to glide many kilometers once they were released. The pods also had a small electric pusher fan on the tail. Omu explained that this was not for lift, but would be used to guide the balloons as they ascended and correct their drift as they floated the 120 kilometers to the northwest. Omu, 
How do we know that the upper level winds are blowing in the right direction and speed? Nautilus had been releasing small weather balloons every hour or so since you took control of the radar unit on Cerro Crocker. Naomi has been tracking those balloons using the radar and has developed a detailed model. The upper level winds have proven to be quite stable and consistent. When do we release the balloons with the bats? I asked. It is now 1944, John. The balloons will be released in approximately 25 minutes. Each will take slightly more than two hours to ascend to their maximum altitude and drift towards the target. Once the pods are released, they will take another 26 minutes to descend to their targets. They will arrive over the target base at around 2250 and disperse to their final positions. How are we going to bring 500 bats up on deck and get them loaded in their pods in 25 minutes? I asked. They will self-deploy. She walked over and opened the port side deck hatch and then stood back. Up out of the hatch flew a stream of bats. They split into multiple columns and landed near the line of pods before carefully stowing themselves into each. Cool. Of course, they could fly themselves up on deck. I was foolish for not considering that until now. In less than five minutes, all the bats were packaged and ready to be released. Omo and I then carefully connected each pod to a suspended balloon working to ensure that none of the tethers crossed or became tangled. Four minutes until we crossed the Rubicon, John, Omu said. The stress must have been affecting me as I spent the first minute of the wait daydreaming about how cool the nickname Rubicon John was. It summed up much of my recent activities perfectly. Then I got serious and spent the remaining wait looking over all our hard work. The line of balloons suspended above the anchor cable were standing there like tall pale ghosts in the darkness. The 25 tethers leading from the balloons to the fully packed glide pods were lit up by my goggles overlay like strings of Christmas lights. I felt both pride at what we had accomplished and anxiety at what we were about to unleash. Ready, John? You lift each pod up, clear of its neighbors, and I will unclip and release the correct balloon, Omu said. I went to the first pod. It was wet and covered with dew as it had begun to sprinkle. I could see the bats inside staring out at me as I carefully lifted their little bus above my head. The tether attached to each drooped down onto the deck and ran to where Omu was waiting by the anchoring clips. Here we go, she yelled as she pulled the first release. The balloon shot upward while I held the pod angled so its tether did not snag on its wings. In seconds, the elastic tether pulled the bat pod out of my hands. I watched it rising quickly into the darkness for a few seconds. Give them hell, boys, I yelled and scrambled for the next pod. One by one, over the next three minutes, all the balloons and bat pods were launched. When the last one was gone, Omu and I got busy clearing the deck. She removed the anchor cable and tossed it over the port side while the deployable sail retracted back below deck. I pushed the balloon extruder, the power cabling, the empty doers, and the wheel dolly over the starboard side. I was careful to not slip off myself over the curved edge of Nautilus's hull. That would have been bad for our timetable. Omu had finished sealing the port side aft hatch about the same time I finished clearing the deck. And together, we both stood waiting and watching as the front hangar hull groaned and began rising into the deployment position. Omu would be flying Habu to deliver the first of the two assault quadruped carrier pods to the waters just off the target island. She had less than half an hour to get the pod there as it would take over two hours for the aquatic drone to navigate it the rest of the way to the target causeway. When she was aboard the aircraft, I braced myself against the downwash as she took Habu up a few dozen meters and hovered. The hangar deployment arms then brought up the first of the two troop pods. The boxy streamlined pod was soon on the deck and waiting for Habu to drop down and link up. After Omu did just that, I ran over and inspected the four latches holding the pod to the underside of Habu. They all looked secure and I retreated back to the deck hatch. Looks good, Omu. Good luck, I sub-vocalized. See you in an hour, John. I heard as Habu screamed and began to rise, lifting its heavy load. Thank goodness I was hanging onto the deck hatch, or I would have been blown off the boat from the heavy downwash. I should have gone below before she left. The gale from the aircraft's lift fans soon weakened, and I looked up to watch Habu disappear into the overcast. Instead of heading below directly, I remained on the deck for a moment. Now that all the gear in Habu was gone, it was quiet and still. I reached up and turned off the night vision on my goggles. 
The moon must have risen somewhere above the solid cloud cover as it was not quite pitch black. Naomi had turned on the red lighting in the chamber below the open starboard hatch, and this caused an inverted cone of red to illuminate the mist and falling drizzle. Is everything okay on deck, John? Naomi must be wondering why I had not returned below. Everything is fine, Naomi. I'm just clearing my head. Give me a few minutes. What a surreal scene. I found myself thinking of my dead wife and daughter. Their memories were strong tonight. Did my recollections pretend that I would soon join them? I hope not quite yet. Fifty minutes later, I was below and in the workshop about to put on my battle suit. I had gotten out of my damp coveralls and had taken a quick shower to refresh myself. I then had donned the silky bodysuit that Naomi had recently made for me. It was designed to be worn beneath my suit like a body stocking. When I asked about it, Naomi was a bit evasive but had admitted the underwear had both coagulation and auto-constriction features. Oh joy, I did not ask for details. She had to remind me to retrieve the portable processor device which contained her partial presence from the data vault. The medium suitcase sized package was now sitting on the floor of the salon next to me. We would be taking it with us to the enemy base. A side benefit of its presence was that it was linked to my brain implant and also would be linked to Omu and Habu. This would increase their abilities while they were in short range wireless contact with the high capacity processor. Naomi had reported that she was tracking Habu and the balloons. Both were on their respective courses and on schedule. I got the battle suit on and sealed it up. It ran a self-diagnostic test as I moved about the workshop. I gathered up the two magazines worth of ammo and stuck them to my chest. Hans and Franz carried more for me. Next was the auxiliary power cell backpack. It was hung from the bulkhead and I backed the suit up and connected with the module. The suit's heads-up display now showed that I had nearly 200% power available. I made my way up and into the hangar hull. With the auxiliary backpack, there was no way I was fitting through the narrow deck hatch. Instead, I'd ride the hangar deploy mechanism to the flight deck to meet Habu when it returned. The suit was heavy, and I felt its synthetic muscles working to augment my movements. In the hangar hull, I locked my boots in the processor suitcase onto the deployment arm and hung on to the second quadruped carrier pod. The bright lights in the chamber dimmed and were replaced by a few dim red floor lamps. The front hatch to the rest of the boat sealed itself shut and I felt the chamber vibrate as its larger main seals released. With a jolt, the hull began its tilting deployment motion. Here we go. We rotated back to near 45 degrees and the deployment arms started moving up and out onto the deck. Once there, I checked with Naomi and found that Omu and Habu would arrive in less than five minutes. While I waited, I took a seat on one of the rear guide fins of the carrier pod. I checked the clock function in the suit's HUD. It was 2120. The clock also had a countdown to the commencement of our offensive attack. This was set for 23 o'clock or an hour before midnight. I smiled when I noted the day. It was Friday night. Huh, what a way to start the weekend. I sat there waiting in the darkness with my fists clasped in front of me and with my elbows on my knees. I could see the outline of my suited arms and legs lit up in my visor's augmented overlay, along with the outline of Nautilus beyond. I had a weird thought and smiled, wishing I had a picture of this. It would make a great cover for a science fiction novel. It was still hard to believe that I was living this, and what I was about to do was real and far wilder than most of the stories in the books I had read. One minute, John, I stood up and moved away from the transport pod, along with Naomi's processor case. I selected the mode to lock my boots to the deck so Habu would not topple me off. 30 seconds later, I saw a highlighted image of Habu descending through the murk. My visor's HUD was projecting the aircraft's location by using the relayed radar data from Naomi. I heard the aircraft a few seconds before I actually saw it. Habu appeared through the fog and slowly settled down to land on top of the carrier pod. This pod had been made much more rugged than the last, just for this reason, and also because it would not have to float or be pushed through the water. The aircraft's fans spooled down and the side hatch opened. My little friend hopped out onto the deck and joined me. All ready to be the hero, John? Ready as I'll ever be, I guess. How about instead we let the bats do all the hard work and we sit this one out from the mountaintop? Don't worry, it will be fine. Just in case, though, I've packed clean underwear for you. Smart ass. Homu took the processor case and fitted it into the bomb bay storage compartment along the underside of the forward fuselage of Habu. 
The carrier pod mounting latches left just barely enough room for the compartment's doors to open. I stooped to look inside the compartment. Not much room left in there for you with your chunky new body, I said. Likewise, you will have to squeeze your fat ass into the cockpit this time around also, she replied without missing a beat. I laughed. Let's see if I can haul my lard ass up into the pilot's seat. It was not hard at all as there were steps built into the carrier pod. I did not say anything, nor did Omu when I had to struggle to fit the bulky battle suit into the pilot's seat. I had to recline and lower it a bit to squeeze in. Before the hatch closed, I saw Omu slide herself between the carrier and her storage compartment. The hatch sealed and I checked that the indicator showed that the storage bay was also sealed. You can fly us to Cerro Crocker on manual, John. We have plenty of time. Follow the general course indicated on the overlay and stay below the line of sight of the base on Baltra Island. The thought of flying Habu myself did not bother me as I had three very powerful artificial intelligences on board, limiting my ability to screw up. If I managed to crash despite their presence, then I damn well deserved to crash. I would have certainly earned it. Habu's functions and status were projected onto my hood's visor. I made the motions to spool up the engines to take off levels, and we just started to vibrate. Hmm. I increased power way higher than I had ever before, and we began to rise. Habu sure is heavy and sluggish, I said. Yes, she also has a fat ass tonight. I did not bother with true vision images, as it would only have shown dark murk. The enhanced view clearly showed the nearby Española island, five kilometers to our north. I pointed Habu west and pushed the throttles to max again. Our first waypoint would be Floriana Island, about 90 kilometers away. From there, we would turn north and fly towards Santa Cruz Island, 70 kilometers further on. We would go feet dry directly south of Cerro Crocker, with that peak hiding us from Baltra Island. Finally, we would find a clearing just below the peak to land and wait. From that location, the enemy facility was only minutes away to the north of the small mountain. If the weather allowed, though, we would be making that final sprint by working around Santa Cruz and hugging the wave tops as we approached Baltra from below its southern shores. The eastern and southern approaches to the small island were edged with 20-meter cliffs, and we should be able to approach very closely while remaining undetected. Habu flew the 170 kilometers to Cerro Crocker in under half an hour. I was impressed as we had a lot of extra drag. I set her down 100 meters south of the mountaintop installation. My clock function said it was 2215. We had a wait of around 25 minutes before we needed to take off and begin our final approach. When Habu's fans had spooled down, Omu slipped out of her storage compartment and ran up to the hilltop equipment area. She was stringing along a thin data fiber behind her. Five minutes later, she was back in her hold and I was watching a current enhanced radar image showing the 25 bat pods gliding down from the southeast. They were still many kilometers away, but were moving fast. Are they all still on course? I asked. Yes, John, 22 of the pods are within the projected glide slope. The remaining three are slightly off course, but will still make landfall near the island. Those bats will be delayed by three to five minutes. The numbers of on-target bats are high enough to not delay the attack, however, one of the intelligences answered. I guessed it was Naomi. Any idea on where the aquatic drone and that assault unit pod are at? No, John, it is my hope that as we approach low from the southeast over the narrow canal Atabaca, we will detect the aquatic unit just before it arrives at the causeway. Updated time of attack, 2250. I sat there silently watching both the dropping pods on radar and the clock. At 2235, or 15 minutes before the bats were due to start their attack, Naomi let me know it was time to begin our final approach. This time I was a passenger, and the AI was the pilot. We cut the radar data feed and took off, heading to the east following the hillside. Habu stayed low, only a dozen meters above the treetops, as we dropped down towards the eastern shoreline of the island. Once we were over the ocean, we dropped even lower. The indicator said we were three meters above the waves, but they sure looked closer in my night-enhanced view. I followed our progress as we circled around the northeastern edge of Santa Cruz Island and headed for the gap between it and Baltra Island. The tall cliffs behind us should hide us from any air search radar on the launching causeway to the north. While we flew on, the clock kept ticking down. At 22.48, we stopped. 
To the north of us, less than a hundred meters away, were the rocks of Baltra Island. Two and a half kilometers beyond them was the launch facility and the enemy AI. I wonder if we could get lucky and find that tonight the enemy was going to be shut down for a self-diagnostic or something. Probably not. I continued to watch the clock ticking closer to 2250. I hoped the little bats had made it.